Hey, good morning, Tracy. Hey, Sean. Welcome everybody to the June 23rd Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee call. Um, as you are all aware, two things that we must abide by. The first one is the antitrust policy notice that is currently being displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, uh, which is linked in the agenda. All right. <clears throat> so for the agenda, we have our standard announcement. Uh, the first thing here, Hyperledger Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. If you have something that you would like to uh, reach hundreds of developers, uh, please consider leaving a comment on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. Uh, the sec uh, I'm sorry, any other announcements that anybody would like to make? Okay, no announcements. Daniel, I keep seeing you come off mute, but we cannot hear you. I see you raised your hand, still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear me now. Oh, okay, <laughs> so I guess my AirPods are not working. <laughs> um, <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, everyone, good evening. Um, just wanted to do a quick announcement that the agenda for Hyperledger Global Forum is now on the event website. So you can navigate to hyperledger.org. Um, we lost you, Daniela. Yes, we did lose Daniel. Yeah. Well, I think as she said, it's it's on the website and a link will be provided uh, post haste. I promise. All right. Uh, so very good. Any other announcements that anybody would like to make? All right. Uh, so if there's no other announcements, then uh, we do have a quarterly report that came in a couple of days ago. Um, shortly after I sent out the agenda, the Hyperledger Ursa report came out. I did only see a few people had reviewed that of this as of this morning. Um, so for those of you who have not reviewed it yet, please do take the opportunity to do that. Um, only one question so far is gone back to the Hyperledger Ursa team. It's around um, the, the requirements that we have for the inclusive language statement. Um, so we'll wait to hear back from the Ursa community. In general, I think the, the report is um, talking about the, the focus that they have on a security issue. Um, and so I'm assuming that they're probably working on that and we'll at some point get back to uh, this question here around the inclusive language statement. Any other comments that anybody has on this report before we move forward in the agenda? No, but Tracy, I mean, I scrolled down to the page to put the comment and realize you had put exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I noticed that most of the reports that we've been getting um, either say no, or they actually give a link to a PR, which is 
Um, great. So we'll hopefully get a response back, like I said. Nathan? Uh, just to add to that, we did discuss um, the comments on this document in our URSA meeting yesterday. Um, the, the, the project is working on the security issues first, but there's this set of refactoring tasks called Operation Oso um, that includes checking for any of the language and adding some of the other checks to um, what's going on in the system. And we, we don't have anything that we expect would violate either, any of those checks, but we didn't want to say yes until we were sure that everything met with the spec. That's a great update. Thanks, Nathan. Anything else on the URSA report before we move forward in, in the agenda? All right. Um, so for the agenda, uh, we have some uh, decisions to make. Uh, the first two are around lab stewards. So in the uh, initial proposal for Hyperledger Labs, it was stated that uh, there was an initial set of lab stewards and that anybody who wanted to become a lab steward could volunteer um, by basically sending us a message and then uh, having the TSC approve their, um, their service here as a lab steward. So we actually ended up getting two um, folks to volunteer to become a lab steward, one, um, that you are all well familiar with as he is part of the technical steering committee. Um, the other one, Arun, you nominated um, and has been working in, in the blockchain and the Hyperledger space for, for some time. So um, I had put out on Discord a request to vote, um, but I don't think we ended up with enough votes for either to say that uh, we could move forward with that. I think we ended up with on Discord five, um, yeses and for accomplish and then six yeses for uh, a non so we have to bring this to the tsc for a vote um so kamlesh you have your hand up uh so um tracy if we are just uh, need one lab steward then uh, i can withdraw my application my nomination uh, no i i don't think it's a problem to have uh two um kamlesh i think it's right now we have Arno and myself that are, are very active and I've seen Vipin start to become active again recently with um, approving PR. So um, given that we need at least two lab stewards to review and approve uh, incoming labs, I think uh, okay. I think it's fine to have two. Okay, okay. Yeah, appreciate that, that thought though. Um, so yeah, let's uh, go ahead and have the vote for um, Kamlesh to become a lab steward. So I don't know uh, if somebody wants to, well, I'll, I guess I'll make the nomination to somebody want a second. I will second. All right. Um, so Rai or Sean, I don't know who wants to take us to a vote for Kamlesh. Um, I'll do it. All right, is this a roll call vote or a yes, or a voice vote? Uh, let's just do a voice vote. I think that's fine. Okay. Uh, all of those who wish to abstain from the vote, uh, please say so. All of those who uh, wish to vote against the proposal before the floor. All of those who wish to vote for, say aye. 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 The motion passes by voice vote. All right, thanks, Ray. And then uh, the second one is non. Um, Arun, I don't know if you want to say just a few words about non um, to allow for the rest of the committee to to learn a, a bit more about his role in, in Hyperledger. Sure. So um, I guess I had a brief introduction of Anand's role in, in the uh, Discord channel. Um, so he, uh, I mean, as part of his work, he works as a distinguished architect in Walmart within blockchain platforms um, team, and is based in uh, US time zone, right, uh, the central time zone. Um, his his day-to-day -day work is completely involved in blockchain technology at work. And within open source technology, he has been um, a proponent of using um, Hyperledger technology since last five to six years, I would say. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of contribution back into projects, he has been adding um, some of the tools and uh, let's say utilities that are being developed. Mm -hmm but none of them were put into Hyperledger or Hyperledger Labs itself. They're all in his personal um, 
GitHub repo. However, uh, recently or probably like about a year ago, a project was proposed that's called HLF Connector that's now open source via Hyperledger Labs, right? Um, so soon there will be additional capabilities introduced and um, we are also looking into a few other aspects to adopt some of the other projects where we go uh, start maintaining few others. So yeah, he's pretty much involved into what's happening within Hyperledger space. Um, so I felt also to increase, uh, let's say, I am strong proponent, as I said, of bringing in more people, having that responsibility distributed across, so where everybody will feel that they are welcomed at Hyperledger. So that's where I went ahead and proposed Anand. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the brief intro and the background. All right, thanks, Anand. Uh, any, any discussion uh, that anybody wants to have here before we move to a vote? Tracy, if you're saying anything, we can't hear you. Feels like I'm living in a Verizon ad. Well, thanks for speaking up because every time I'm wondering, is it me or? <laughs> um, Tracy, are you back? The answer is no. Um, so if someone wants to uh, move to conduct the vote and second it, let's do it. Uh, do we have Dan? Maybe. No. I have a motion uh, to move to vote for um, it's an odd or a chemist we're voting for? Nod. A nod. Okay, I move uh, to accept a nod as a lab steward, unless there's more discussion. Oh, second. Okay. Uh, everyone who uh, opposes, say nay. Everyone who abstains say, nah, well, okay. Everyone in favor say aye. 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 The uh, motion to approve a nod uh, passes by voice vote. And Tracy, once you get your audio sorted out. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry, okay. sorry about that, guys. Um, <laughs> Bluetooth loves me, uh, sometimes not so much. Um, so thank you all for, for moving that forward. Um, Nathan. Just one more thing I think to say, a thank you to all those who've been working hard to help us as lab stewards. Uh, it's often a very thankless job, but it helps support the growth of our community and a lot of new innovation that's really cool. It's worth going and checking out the labs and thanks to those who have volunteered to be new lab stewards and those who've been keeping the lights on there and making it all work for us. All right, thanks for that, Nathan. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually a really great place to, to start to bring in new people who are interested in contributing. Um, and it's really interesting to see kind of the new things that people are suggesting as they come in. So, um, looking forward to having Pamlesh and Anand help us out in that regard. All right. So the last thing on the agenda that I have here, um, which I don't know is going to, um, be a quick sort of thing uh, is I actually took kind of the comments from last week's discussion on changing from a technical steering committee to the technical oversight committee and um, put together some uh, <laughs> some suggested changes to our charter to the hyperledger charter uh, to reflect kind of the discussion that was had. Um, so in general, I think most of the changes here are um, just around uh, changing it from TSC to TOC. Um, so as I went through and, and did that, um, you can see the changes there. I don't think hopefully that is too much of a, a challenge to get through, but I think there is some um, specific verbiage uh, that exists in uh, the section where we actually talk about how the TSC is appointed. 
So if we could scroll down here in the in the document uh, to where we'll see a bunch of green, uh, red, I guess. Um, so right in this section is is where the the changes have been made. Um, and so these are the things that I want to talk about today. Um, so I didn't see anybody coming in and actually making any other suggested changes to what is here. So hopefully, um, uh, maybe I'm just uh, pausing here and, and giving you guys some time to read this in case you haven't had a chance to read um, the, the changes that were made. And then we can have a discussion on um, some of the points uh, that I think might be potentially controversial. So I'll just give you a minute here. Um, so uh, hopefully you've had a chance to kind of review the suggested changes here. Um, one of the things that I did note in a uh, difference between what it is that we uh, currently have versus what is being suggested here is that, um, you know, the discussion re reflected that we wanted to have all maintainers who had been active in the past year to uh, elect a portion of the Technical Oversight Committee. Um, and the question that I have around that is, we in the past have also included, uh, obviously, contributors, people have made code changes, as well as members of the Technical Steering Committee, the existing Technical Steering Committee, as uh, people who could vote for um, the upcoming, uh, the upcoming, in the upcoming election. Um, so my question here is, we had talked about changing it just to maintainers, which I think is um, fine, which would remove the contributors, but I didn't know how that impacted the, the, the feeling of the existing TSC members being able to also participate in that election. So that's the question that I have out for the TSC. Uh, Arno? Yeah, I actually had a question related to that. So the way I read this now is it's the maintainers that vote but it's you know quote individuals who are active who are who can run for it so this may be the same people but it's not necessarily the same people right the set of maintainers is a much smaller set of people who hopefully are active contributors but you know so i didn't i i was unsure this, this is what you actually meant yeah, so it definitely was. I know, I think, um, you know, in Dano's uh, proposal that he had put out, I, I forget exactly how he said it, but basically it was uh, um, individuals who were active within uh, the industry scope of Hyperledger Foundation, which would imply that even people who don't contribute to Hyperledger um, would be allowed to volunteer themselves as or nominate themselves as uh, somebody who would run for the, in this case, the technical oversight committee. Um, that obviously is a much larger pool than the uh, currently active maintainers uh, for the different projects. Um, so yeah, it, it was intentional that those two um, pools of people were uh, distinct and Happy to you know discuss whether or not that's you know what is wanted or what was intended, but I thought based on our discussion that's where we were at. So I mean the the and you know I'm not opposed to this. I'm trying to understand the ramification of this choice because mm -hmm. you know part of the pain that uh, the staff <laughs> slash Rye has has felt going through the election process every year is to actually figure out what is this list of active individuals that qualify both for running and for voting. And it seems to me that, so in this case, I mean, it simplifies figuring out who gets to vote, but in terms of who gets to be, you know, who can be nominated, it's the same. Is that right? I, that was I, my intent. Yes. I, I agree with that. And I think that it is 
easier to prove that you've uh, been active in the community by pointing people in your nomination statement to links of where you've been, um, where you have been active, right? Versus here's the list that I have to go gather in order to send emails to all of the people who need to vote. Um, I'm obviously putting words into your mouth, Rye, but uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's how I, I know, understand that's that to be. Yeah, so uh, I've been working on a uh, an extraction uh, based on uh, the tool that Tracy provided for finding old repos. Um, and I can get people's activity in the org and what those activities are. Uh, the audit log for GitHub has been expanded significantly uh, in the last, I don't know, two months. So the activities that are showing up in the audit log include all of the things that weren't there before, like PR comments and stuff like that. So we could eventually in the future be able to say they made so many PR comments that was on this or, or it was on these uh, repos and this, that, and the other. So it's it's far easier today than it was even a month ago. All right, well, thanks. I, I, I think that, that makes sense actually. And I, I can see how this is so much easier because there are only so many people when they want to, to be nominated or to nominate themselves. And fundamentally, you only need to, you know, if you care, to check that they are indeed active contributors in some way. So yeah, the burden is much lower than, than what we have right in the past. So that makes sense. Thank you. All right, uh, Kamlesh. So, uh, I think, so I think uh, maybe I think uh, we should also have some kind of category where community will select the some community representative as a TSC member because here like it looks like Hyperledger is selecting the TSC for Hyperledger, like suppose like uh, maintenance from the Hyperledger, governing board also the Hyperledger thing. So it could become like a close, close environment. What we are thinking, what Hyper are thinking, we are just driving that that thing. But maybe we can categorize like uh, a four from the Hyperledger maintainer will select the four thing. Maybe three will select the governing board. Or maybe remaining three will select the community via community board and the people who are in the community members because because actual user who are using the Hyperledger uh, projects, what they think about the Hyperledger and what they need in the Hyperledger as a, as a project and how they want to see the community growing. So I think this should be one kind of a, another category should be added. Can divide like all these three could have an equal equal uh, representation in the TSC. Yeah, so Kamlesh, I know Dana's original proposal had, um, what was it, five individuals being elected or selected by the maintainers, um, four that were being elected by the governing board and two that were elected from the selection of the nine individuals. Um, what I heard in our last meeting was that it was too complex and that people wanted to make this simpler um, in, in what they uh, wanted to do. And they wanted really just to limit it to the maintainers and the governing board to do the selection. Now, um, you know, when I originally started looking at bringing this back to the agenda for this week, I thought about modifying Dano's proposal to reflect kind of those changes. But in the end, given the fact that there was a lot of requests for making this simple, I decided that I would put the changes directly in the charter, um, which would hopefully simplify kind of the, the discussion points um, as we go through. So um, understand your concern is uh, how do we make sure that the organization doesn't become somehow insular? Um, and I don't know that I have a good answer for that um, one way or the other. Angelo? Um, yes, Tracy, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, to be honest, I found this paragraph a little bit ambiguous. Uh, um, and also I, I'm a bit worried about the power balance because I guess these maintainers are the maintainers of the active projects. Mm -hmm. 
And if we set this active uh, bar too low, you know, maliciously, this, uh, these projects, uh, you know, I work in security, so I, I tend to, to think about uh, the, the bad side of things. Uh, so what if they manipulate their list of maintainers to get more power at time of election? This is all, the, this, oh, it's all depending on the way we set this active, uh, uh, this active threshold. So I'm a little bit worried about uh, that part. Um, the, yes, and also I would, I would like to have uh, clearly specified the, uh, as partially was before. So who are the maintainers of the active projects or also other projects uh, and under uh, which are the rules that govern the active, uh, uh, the, the, this tag uh, that we can define this maintainer as active. Thank yeah, you. so I think if you scroll down just a bit, um, Sean, on this page, uh, there is the description right at the bottom here of what a maintainer is. Whoop, a little bit far um, up, up right there. Uh, starting on the bottom of this page to the top of the next page says uh, maintainers are contributors who have the ability to approve pull requests or commit code and contributions directly to a project source code repository. Uh, a contributor may become a maintainer by a majority approval of the existing maintainers. Um, so that is the definition of, of what a maintainer is uh, in this paragraph above. Um, and agree, right? Uh, there is the possibility then that uh, we could game the system by having a single project add a bunch of maintainers that they expect to vote in um, one way or another. That problem exists in the current setup when it has anyone who submits a wiki entry. Um, I don't think it's new, and I think by making it maintainers, we reduce the attack surface for that kind of a civil attack. The civil attack is is not introduced by this change. Okay. Uh, Hart? Yeah, I was just going to elaborate on Dano's comment. This is a problem, or this is a known issue we've had for a long time. And if you go back, you know, to the old TSC email lists, I emailed this about this, you know, about the contributor list, you know, probably five years ago, where with a simple script, you could add, you know, easily 10,000 contributors and completely take over the election. Um, so luckily, you know, so far, no one has done this. And, and in the past elections, we've, you know, I've explicitly pushed for the TSC to be able to throw out, uh, or sorry, not the TSC, the staff to be able to throw out what they consider uh, fraudulent uh, contribution efforts, um, which I don't think we've seen any, uh, but, but we always had that possibility. Um, and as Dano pointed out, the bar for doing this for maintainers is you know, much, much higher. Um, so, so I agree that this is, is certainly an issue in theory, um, but I'm not sure it's something that we've, uh, we've had to deal with in practice. Um, and I think it would be, you know, much harder to, to implement practically than attacking the contributor list. Um, and, you know, the number of people who can add new maintainers in the project is actually quite small. Uh, so it, it would be, you know, uh, problematic from a rational perspective for, for people to actually do this. Um, thanks. All right, thanks Hart. And if we scroll back uh, to the um, major changes here, the other piece I think here is for the maintainers have been active in the past year. Um, I, you know, I think that is an attempt to ensure that, you know, somebody is actually doing maintenance, right, of, of a project and maintaining that project um, from the perspective of approving PRs and commenting on issues and, and you know, making contributions to the code itself uh, as it may be. Um, so I don't, I don't know that that addresses, Angelo, the, the concern, but I, you know, I do think that there is some uh, some verbiage to try and help that, but uh, understand understand your concern as well. Um, happy to have uh, Angelo jump in front of Arno to comment on that aspect. Uh, Tracy, can I say so, also something to respond to? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yeah, the, that's uh, um, 
I understand the the the, the thing of the the sibling attacks, but are we saying now that all the projects uh, must have uh, a cap on the number of maintainers? Uh, so I guess there is an, right now already a, an imbalance between between the number of maintainers between um, among the projects. Maybe Fabric I don't know has ten and the other or uh, the, and the others have very few. Uh, I guess that as soon as we we approve this, there will be a rush on there. There might be a rush in increasing the number of maintainers because that will represent more more power. So to me, more rational to say. Okay, uh, each project gets this amount of votes uh, to be that can be used to elect these six people. That to me seems more fair. So um, I, I hear your uh, pushback there, Angelo. Um, this is, I think, linked to a large number of, of issues with projects that have no maintainers or no active maintainers and projects that have uh, many people in their maintainer list who are not active. Uh, so there, there will need to be something done there uh, by the TSC to say, or the TOC to say who is and isn't a, uh, a maintainer. Um, so yes, that that is a concern. That is a valid concern. Well, thanks, Angela. Thanks, Shrey. Arno, sorry to uh, make you wait. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, I, I actually wanted to discuss further this very point. I mean, and, and to be fair, you know, I, I'm not completely sure where I stand on this issue. And this is why I initially raised my hand and I thought, no, it's okay. I put it down. And then I was like, no, no, actually, I, I do want to say. <laughs> and so bear with me on that. But I actually think one thing we could practically do is have a common policy on how people become maintainer, how they get retired, because we don't have any consistency in this regard across the board. And I don't think putting a limit to the number makes sense because some projects are much bigger than others. And we already have that today, in fact, right? When just, just by the sheer fact that, I mean, the simple fact that th there are projects that are bigger, they have more contributors, and they will have more votes. That's just the way it's been all the time. And so I don't think it changes that. You will have more maintainers naturally in bigger projects than the smaller ones. Uh, if we, I mean, Riot last year in his proposal, he had, you know, uh, come up with the, uh, the proposal where the TSC was divided, but more equally among the different projects. So putting a limit to the number of votes that come from a project is not completely crazy and could be uh, uh, you know, considered. But I think one practical thing we could do again is, is come up with a common policy on you know, what does it take to become a, a maintainer in the first place? And after how much you know, inactivity or so, because you, you might, I mean, right now it says you know, a year, but I, we could have a project that say, hey, after six months, if you have not been active, we kick you out and yet another one will so they, they, it won't be fair across the board because some projects will have you know retired some maintainers while others have not that's what i'm trying to say all right so arno on that particular point um interestingly enough uh we do actually have in the charter itself how a contributor may become a maintainer um and again scroll down just to the top of the next page it says a contributor may become a maintainer by a majority approval of the existing maintainers. Um, so we actually, that's part of the charter. And if our projects have a different way of deciding how a contributor becomes a maintainer, they're probably going against our charter today. Um, secondly, if you recall, Dano had that PR with the inactive maintainer policy. Um, I, can't remember, Dano, help me if I, I'm getting this wrong. Was it, did we go with the inactive maintainer or did we go with the inactive repository as the first um, PR that we ended up merging? We went with inactive maintainer and it's judged by GitHub actions over the past six months. So if you've done nothing for six months, um, you are pushed down. And I think there's a, a request for a three month extension um, that can only be requested once. So there is a policy, it's the default policy um, projects can override it, um, but I'm not aware of any project right now that has a policy that is more um, 
that is looser than what the default policy is. Uh, BASU has one, they have one for the policy. So it's kind of a legacy policy. Um, and it's basically the same thing. After six, two, after two reporting periods, we check on the quarterly reports, uh, maintainers are proposed for removal. And we haven't um, one thought about waking up and, and, and contributing more, but that didn't, you know, I have to look back at the details. Some of them, some of them don't realize that they're, they're not getting stuff counted. Others are like, yeah, I'm out of here. I mean, really what we would like to do is when people leave the project and get a new job unrelated to base, they, they resign. Um, but, you know, that's, that doesn't always happen, which is why we need to have the, you know, in, in, in technical speak, the garbage collection where all the unused um, contributors are cleaned up um, at fixed points. So we, we do have a default policy for moving maintainers to quote unquote emeritus status, which removes their maintainer privileges. All right, thanks. Uh, that, that was what I had recalled, but I wanted to make sure. So, oh no, I think to your point, um, we, we kind of do have what you're suggesting in place. Whether or not we're doing anything about that at this point is another question. Um, and so maybe we just need to make sure that we're enforcing the policies that we um, have put in place. Yeah, and, and to, be, to be honest, I'm not personally concerned that people are going to initially try to game this system. I think it's the kind of things, I mean, I understand Angelo's background and like, you know, he's wired to think about the worst case scenario. <laughs> but I think in practice, you know, I tend to, to be, maybe I'm naive, but you know, I think for the most part, we have people who are trying to do the right thing and then are trying to just screw the system. So I'm happy to go with this. And if we figure, okay, people are, are playing games here, we can always, you know, tighten the ship, so to speak, to say, okay, we need to put extra rules to protection so the system cannot be game so easy. And that's it. It might be too late though. Huh? Well, too late. I mean, come on. What's the end? It's not the end of the world if, you know, one year somebody gets elected because there was a gaming. And it's like, it happens in politics, I believe. <laughs> All right. Uh, Nathan. Um, first, I think uh, this, I guess, echoes now what Arno just said, which is we need to put on our recruiting and marketing hat more so than our security vulnerability hat. Um, voting is not just a multi-party computation and we're not protecting a civil attack necessarily. As long as we have enough transparency with what's going on, we can both hold folks accountable as the vote goes to happen. Um, and we can make it transparent to the elector, the folks who are electing um, the, the TOC members so that, because we can trust that the electorate want, have a long-term stake in what's going on even if someone tries to game the system, as long as it's transparent, the, the voting process can account for that um, because we don't have an uninformed um, voting population. We can make the system transparent so that it has some checks and balances and can be more self-correcting. The other thing I would say here is we, we did very specifically say that the maintainer policy should be up to the project. And I really worry that if we get into this, we're trying to protect every possible vulnerability of the election system, we'll start to be more declarative and enforce more rules on the projects about what can and cannot happen in ways that make it more or very difficult to retain and recruit maintainers because we're adding all this things you have to worry about and overhead and politics around the policy of being a maintainer. When the main focus is you got a whole lot of work to do and you're actually making some sacrifice to help support the community in that way. So I, I, I worry that if we get into this, you know, should we, shouldn't we, or do you actually meet all of the requirements and make the checklist really large, that will actually discourage people from doing the work that we need them to do anyway. And I, I like the idea that the maintainership buys some more power in the sense that it, it encourages the project and hopefully the contributors to try to be a maintainer, even if they would naturally shy away from the work because there's a little bit more incentive around it. So if it makes the maintainership more inclusive, I think it's actually a really good thing, even if it does open us up to some, you know, some projects have more maintainers than others. Well, hopefully all projects can get more people who want to do that work and share that burden of being a maintainer. So that, that, that didn't bother me, um, especially because like I say, if, if we have some transparency around the voter role, 
which if they're all maintainers, I think we probably could have more maintain more transparency about who is a voter because maintainers are publicly listed as folks who are there to help support the development process. All right, thanks, Nathan. Hart? Thanks, Tracy. I'll also point out that the system with, uh, with just giving projects votes can be effectively long-term gained by fragmenting a project into many smaller projects, uh, thus getting more votes. You know, we had this sort of in the past where, you know, every fabric SDK was, was a top level project, for instance. Um, you know, and, and if we were really worried about people gaming the system, right? They could just do this. They could just, you know, if, if it's one project, one vote, they could just break their project, you know, it, into many smaller projects. Um, and I think this is, you know, this would also be, you know, really bad and, and we don't want to encourage this. Um, so, you know, I, I think no matter how you structure the election, there are going to be issues with gaming the system. Um, but, you know, particularly you know, if, if, if we do it in, in one of these ways, you know, it's very easy to detect when people are gaming the system. And, you know, I'm not sure people are willing to risk their reputations to do that. All right, thanks, Hart. Uh, uh, can, Nathan... let me, can I jump in? Because mine relates to what uh, he was saying about Fabric. So Fabric does have, like, we still have maybe like 25 repositories. Most of those are uh, sub projects that get very little action. Uh, but the SDKs and chain codes are included there. So I think if we go forward with this, we might want to say something like um, the maintainers from the core, the core project repositories, because we literally have, you know, we have many, many people across all the SDK and chain code um, sub repositories. And I'm not sure the intent here is to include all those people. I think the intent is to include anybody who's willing to spend time being a maintainer and working on um, that aspect of contribution. Uh, Nathan, your hand is still up. Okay, Jim. Yeah, I don't want to uh, continue to harp on this too much, but I, I do feel like uh, agreeing with um, Arnold and, and uh, Nathan that I, to me, I think the process of uh, nominating and approving a maintainer it, from my observation of both uh, Hyperledger and other projects is a celebrated process that I think people take pride in and, and take, take it very seriously. Uh, and we should treat it as a cornerstone of the whole process where when someone be, becomes a maintainer, uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it carries a lot of weight on the recognition from the community rather than thinking that this is opportunity for people to game the system. I, I just don't feel like practically that's gonna happen. Um, that's point number one. The second is uh, really to what, what David was saying. I feel like um, I definitely see the sort of the importance of being a maintainer in the core project versus uh, secondary or supporting projects. Um, I just, don't think it's necessarily that uh, if you're a maintainer on the SDK or a connector rather than the core uh, piece of a uh, ecosystem uh, that your contribution should be less recognized. So I, I guess what I'm saying is um, maintainers of all repositories in the uh, in, in, in the ecosystem, whether it's Fabric or uh, Firefly, should all be recognized equally. Um, yeah, that, that's it for me. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, Daniel. So when I wrote this and I went to maintainers, um, the intent when I said maintainers was anybody who's in good standing and has the organizational right um, to push the merge button would get a vote. And I, I want to echo um, Jim's feeling there that if if you can push the merge button, no matter how small your domain is, um, you're contributing to the project and you have responsibilities and duties and privileges that you need to, um, you know, that you need to operate it correctly. So 
if you have the right to push the merge button, I think you should have the right to vote on oversight matters for the project you're in. Um, so that's that's my my take on what was intended. If projects want to limit to a subset of it, we could have that discussion. I wouldn't be opposed to it, but the intent was that if you can push the merge button, you should be able to push the vote button. All right, thanks, Dana. Um, Sean, can we scroll back up? Um, so this whole conversation started uh, because one, I think that people were just reading it to begin with, but I did ask a question that has not been answered yet. Um, besides maintainers, do we want the technical steering committee, the existing technical steering committee or in the future, the uh, existing technical oversight committee to be able to also participate in the vote? Angelo? Oh, to me, no. Okay. Anyone else? I would also say no, because the TSC members can talk to the governing board, right, and give them recommendations. So the governing board could consider those recommendations from the TSC. Okay. My only worry is, is uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Nathan. Uh, when the, when the governing board has to pick folks, I think the only concern sometimes is is are they closely connected enough that they have a, a really good candidate list? And I think that what was just pointed out, as long as they're talking with the technical community, they should be fine. All right, thanks, Nathan. Arun. Hey Tracy, I just want to again reiterate uh, whatever was already answered. I would say no to that as well. Um, and along with that, I had a question or probably a comment, right, regarding nomination process, which is, I mean, it's written as governing board electing remaining five individuals. Um, do we again want to put rules around those five individuals say that they are part of the same maintainers community or, I mean, that was one of the question or an, another kind of restriction or um, for, for those individuals could also be a cap with uh, some, let's say, organization. So do we want to discuss those details as well on today's call? Uh, yeah, we definitely want to discuss everything um, because my hope was to try and get this to vote, which I don't think is going to happen. Um, but uh, the governing board electing the remaining five individuals, uh, those five individuals would be coming from the initial set of nominees. Um, so the intention, right, if you look at the kind of funnel here is you have a set of nominees, uh, then the maintainers select six of those and the governing board selects uh, from the remaining uh, to come up with the entire technical oversight committee. So um, it, it's not that the governing board is selecting maintainers unless those maintainers decided to nominate themselves uh, to run initially. So everything is coming from that initial pool of nominees. Happy to see if we can clarify that in this section. Um, it, as uh, uh, if that would help. Arno? Yeah, I mean, if that's the intent, this should definitely be clarified because I didn't okay. read it that way. And I, and I was going to say, I think it's a bit of, I actually like this process a bit better because it's, it's it actually from just practical point of view, it's much easier to, to, to set up and operate that way. Uh, otherwise, you have to have yet another round of nomination just from the, for the governing board to vote on. It can be a bit like messy. But I thought there was another question you raised before it's like the TOC members, do they get to vote? Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes, that's correct. And so far I've heard only no's. Yeah, but I quite frankly, I think this is so I don't know, like uh, I mean in practice, like here today, how many of us are non-maintainers somewhere? Do we have people who are not maintainers? Uh, and, there and are my, a few my, of us, yes. Because my point is, I think that the, 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 the okay, maybe then the, my point is not right. I, I was thinking that in practice, they, this is the same set of people anyway, but maybe that's not quite right. Yeah, I think I think there are definitely a couple of folks on the current TC who are not um, maintainers. 
today. All right, come with. So uh, this is like I did also mention like uh, uh, with this process we are kind of removing the community involvement. Like when like you see the Troy Troy's comment in the in the document, like maybe like governing board can do the selection of fixes. Like they can decide whom to select. There is no kind of community involvement. And I think I think this is currently even uh, if we see the other open source communities. If, if we see the selection of the representative from the closed environment, then we are not kind of encouraging the community involvement and even not hearing the word community want wants in the in the hyperledger projects and how they want to see the community bring what kind of project and what the features the community need, the actual user who are building on, on top of such projects. Uh, so are you suggesting then that you don't like that this is limited to just the maintainers voting? Yeah, so like for example, maintainers select the maintainers one, or maybe like a governing body, like already like representing some of the companies in, in the board. So they can also select their specific candidates if they like, but if community like the community people, so it's not necessarily like the all the TST members should be led by community, but we can also have one category like community uh, community member also elect some maybe two three representatives some percentage in the in the community. So that can be here. Otherwise, like for example, in the downline three to four five years, what is hyperledger building is building according to the what hyperledger thinks, not the actual user and community people who are building on it. So even like what I'm th thinking because just today I had about of some companies and they are thinking the same thing like. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what is Hyperledger doing and even Hyperledger, uh, Hyperledger is kind of uh, reducing his own instead in terms of complex, complexing the projects and comp having a lots of number of projects and even that is so much complex. So like uh, even, even their manager service, managing service also so much complex. So if we have done the representation of the community thing and what the user thinks, then in the future it could also become more complex. We will build what we are thinking as a hyperledger project and hyperledger community, not the actual user community. So I think there should be some representation from the community itself, the actual users who are implementing it. So, so I think the intent here, right, is not to limit the set of nominations to only people who are currently involved in hyperledger, but people who are involved in really the blockchain ecosystem or whatever it is that Hyperledger, the scope of Hyperledger as it may be defined in the future. Um, and, and so I, I think that the, the challenge obviously is that somebody new coming in who puts their name in the hat uh, to be nominated and to hopefully come through and get elected um, has to somehow be known by both the maintainers, well, either the maintainers or the or people in the governing board, right? Um, and I think that's the that's true today, right? If you think about kind of the election cycles that have happened for past TSC, um, it's been uh, open to basically anybody who's contributed to Hyperledger, which in some way will get them some initial recognition, recognition, but. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that everybody in the community knows them. And so as we, as we have voted with the contributors of Hyperledger, um, if you don't know anybody, you're somewhat dependent on their nomination statement to determine whether or not you want to include them um, in, the, in your vote, right? Um, so there's been a number of times in the past when I voted where there are people that I don't know um, rare, but there are people who have suggested that they, um, you know, want to run. And I've looked at their nomination and said, okay, who is this person? What have they done? Um, does their nomination statement speak to me in some way that means that I would like to include them on the, the technical steering committee? So I think that that will remain true uh, with this process. I don't think that this process is changing any of that. It's just changing the people who are voting um, for those people.
Arno? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've always been of the opinion that, you know, if anybody is interested in being on the TSC or later on the talk, I mean, I would expect them to participate. I mean, these meetings are open to anybody. We don't shut down anyone. And I think it's, you know, if I, if I were in that position and I come to a new community and, you know, I'm interested in this kind of role, I would already act as it. And, you know, that's, it's yeah. a pretty simple thing to do to, to, you know, get out of the, uh, you know, the, the dark and be known. And so that once you nominate yourself, you're not an unknown entity. And so I think this process from that point of view already allows anybody to come in and, and, and participate and be known so that they don't have this problem that uh, Kemalesh is responding, is talking about. And by the way, the governing board includes a representative from the general membership, right? Which is like everybody in the community. So there is also representation of the general community at the governing board level. Yeah, I, I think that's a, an important point. The, the first point that you made, right? Um, come to the meetings, express your comments and concerns and you actually end up having a voice that people um, will decide whether or not they think is a good voice to direct the, the community in the future. Right. Um, I, I think it's it's not hard, right? You come to the meeting, you raise your hand along with everybody else, and I'll call on you. Uh, it's not. I'm not going to not call on somebody because I am not part of the current technical steering committee. Um, you know, this is intended to be an open discussion with anybody in the community who wants to join and participate in these conversations. Angela. Yeah, maybe last thing I was uh, the, 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 from at least last thing from my side, I was thinking uh, we are the TSC of a block of a, a consortium that is about blockchain and blockchain started with the revolution of Bitcoin who solved the problem of uh, uh, sibling attacks over the Internet. I would rather see like a blockchain oriented solution to get the votes to decide uh, on, 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 on any decision that we have to take. I was thinking something like a new consensus protocol that we call it uh, proof of contribution. And then we use this, we use, if we are really the DSC of a blockchain project, we should come up with a protocol to solve these problems. I will find it. I will, if I find a solution and my, my company allows me to share, I will share. All right, Angelo. Um, I think that's uh, probably going to be a project that is um, beyond the scope of what we have today, um, just given the, the timing of when I expect the election to occur. But I do think it's an interesting one, Angelo, um, and brings up a lot of thoughts for myself. So uh, I did see, as we were discussing a lot of uh, start of conversations that are happening inside of the actual document uh, where people are asking questions and responding to those questions um, that we obviously haven't gotten through. Um, so that tells me that nobody actually uh, had the opportunity to review this before the meeting, um, which means that we're not ready to make a decision on this yet. I think there is still a lot of open questions and concerns before we get to the point of making a decision. So please, please, please take the opportunity to um, continue the discussion in the documents. I specifically will not be here next week. I am on the holiday. Um, Dano is going to run the meeting. I know that there are already a couple of agenda items that exist. Um, one around um, a presentation on the Ethereum merch, and then the second one Arun, you asked to um, take some time from the TSC to talk about the security task force and kind of the outcomes from that task force. Uh, happy to have this also be an agenda for, for your uh, conversations, continued conversations next week. Um, and yeah, I guess with that, I'm going to close the meeting and I will see you in two weeks. And hopefully we'll have some good conversations on this document for consideration for next week and uh, come to some sort of conclusion on this particular topic. Thank you all for joining and uh, have a Thank great you. week. Uh
Have a good vacation. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Have a good vacation. Bye.